the eyes. Now I want you to take your Bibles and turn to uh, the book of Psalms. We're going to look at the 11th Psalm and more particularly verse 3. So Psalm 11, verse 3. Now uh, next week we're going to be looking probably at Zephaniah and we'll be talking about that a little bit more. But this is a question, and let me read in verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Let me read that again. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And you know, that's a, that's a good question in light of the world that we're living in right now. Um, I had a friend of mine send me a video a few weeks ago. Many of you may have seen it. It went viral. Uh, it was a video by a man named Dave, Dana Coverstone. Dana Coverstone had put a video up. It's a YouTube video in which he shares dreams that he's been having, three particular dreams. And let me say this. If you go and you view that video, it can shake your world. It can shake you up a little bit. Be prepared before you view the, the video. A friend of mine sent me that video, and uh, I sat down and, and watched it. And, and uh, afterwards, she had asked me, she's back and forth to Israel. She's a businesswoman, a CPA, very brilliant woman. She said, what do you think of this? I said, normally, I might not give it much attention. But I said, if you could see the sermon on my desk today that I was working on that so disturbed me that I came into this sanctuary and prayed for a very long time, I said, uh, I said it may make you reevaluate this video. He's warning in this video, in these dreams the possibility of a great worldwide and more particularly in our nation a, a somewhat of an implosion. Now when something implodes meaning it collapses from within. Okay, it's a difference. And so I watched this video but I was also working on this message how to raise a family how to raise a family in an imploding nation. So before I got that video, I was already working on this message. Now, I don't want to discourage you necessarily, and I don't want you to believe that this is a doomsday kind of message. Uh, I was born 1955. I've seen this country in the 1960s. Believe you me, it was really bad in the 60s. And there were probably a lot of people that thought we might not survive the 1960s. But let me ask you a question. Are we living in a nation today and are we living in a world today that could be on the verge of imploding? We're living in unstable times and we sense it as believers. You know, what are the threats? What are the threats to America? Let me tell you, first of all, there are external threats to America right now. What are they? We face a lot of bullies all over the world. We see this in North Korea. Right now, China stretching and exercising its muscle over, over Hong Kong. Uh, there's always the possibility of unrest between China and Taiwan. China seems to be in a position right now that would cause us to be somewhat concerned. North Korea has been uh, a nation that has caused us some concern. The Soviet Union, Russia, what will happen there? Some of the Islamic regimes right now seem to be muscling up, and so our world seems to be very, very unstable. Outwardly, we have a lot of enemies, and outwardly, we are becoming more isolated, and that's frightening. But we also have inward problems. We have inward enemies. And one of them, I'm going to deal with one each week. And in in two weeks from today, I'll deal with the last one. And I pray that uh, when I finish that sermon, you will have a clear agenda as to how to turn this from an imploding nation. 
What can we do as a body of Christ? But I want to deal with one threat today that I believe is inward, and it's called counterculture. Now, counterculture, that terminology may not be familiar to you. You may know it as political correctness. How many of you have heard that kind of terminology, being politically correct? It seems to be the end thing right now. Many are warning around the world that this is robbing the United States of its voice, of its dialogue. Society now seems to be the policeman, the American social society, our order today seems to be policing the nation. It's now empowered with society, with the majority of our population. And many are saying that it's stopping free speech. It's stopping the ability to think and to work through our problems. If you don't align today with political correctness, if you're not part of that, uh, of, of that regime or that group, then the reality is, is that uh, you can be fired. You feel alienated and ostracized from people that you once felt close to? Do you feel that? Editors are fired. Books are burned or withdrawn. Journalists are fired. We have one in our building has not been here. This is the third Sunday and we mess her. But the stress and the pressure on journalists today is unbelievably difficult. They can lose their jobs if they say the wrong thing like that. Professors are being fired. Teachers are being fired. Uh, if you're outside the political correct environment of our society today, then the reality is it can come at great cost. If you say the wrong thing today, then there can be quick reprisal. You can be fired. You can be shelved in the academia world, again, in journalism, and even within the church. We're beginning to feel this even within the church. And let me say this, there are a lot of pastors today who are more concerned about political correctness than they are about preaching the Word of God. This is the environment that we live in. If I say the wrong thing, I can be so ostracized and alienated, you'll have no choice but to remove me from the position that I serve. That's the environment today in America. If you say the wrong thing, you can be fired. If you say the wrong thing, everything that you've done in the way of success can immediately be taken away. I debated on using this as an example, but we see this even in the Colin Kaepernick and the Drew Brees and some of these sports figures and the tension now even within the NFL. Reggie and I were talking about Colin Kaepernick and Colin Kaepernick who took the knee with the 49ers and during the national anthem to speak to his opposition as to how the blue and law enforcement were treating black males has got the attention not only of this nation but the world. Reggie and I were talking about one of the things that we noticed after he did that the first time, he then went over to war veterans, shook their hands and thanked them for their service. It's been a quiet demonstration of just simply a man dropping to his knee to let people know that he is in opposition to a real problem in this nation. And it would have probably, in 2016, it might have drifted away, but it gained strength with the death of George Floyd. Colin Kaepernick lives in the United States. He has the ability and the freedom to be able to do that. Drew Brees, in a while back in an interview, made the statement that being former former military, or I mean being a family of military, a grandfather, a great grandfather, and some of his family serving in the military, that he could never see himself bowing his knee to during the national anthem. And immediately, the sports world, the industry, Hollywood, entertainment, immediately began to pounce upon him to the degree that LeBron James made this statement that his career was finished. His Hall of Famer, who set the record for the most yardage 
LeBron James said his career's over with. He'll, he'll never play again. He'll be unaccepted within the realm of the sports world. Why? Because he said the wrong thing. I'm a former military officer. What I hold in my hand is a purple heart. I would like to say that I earned it, but I did not. This is my father-in-law, Charlie Tucker, who's died. If you've never seen one before, this is it. You get this when you're wounded in the line of service. My father-in-law was Charlie Tucker. Knees in the South Pacific. The battleship that he was on was hit hard by the Japs. He had shrapnel in his head his entire life. He got the Purple Heart. I've been with him to the ear, nose, and throat doctor because for the rest of his life he had, he had sinus problems. He endlessly had problems with headaches and sinus issues and all these problems that came from the fact that there was shrapnel in his head that could never be surgically removed. He had to live with that. The United States gave him the Purple Heart. And because of the Purple Heart, Colin Kaepernick has the ability to bow his knee and to express his opposition against a nation that mistreats one ethnicity by law enforcement. That's powerful. The other is this is that it gives the freedom when you live in a country like this to be able to live your life, to share your heart, to speak the truth. It's a great privilege. If you've never been out of this country, you'll find that sometimes uh, when you come back in, you just thank God that you're here. But people are afraid. There are two things that will make people afraid to speak truth. And the Bible says, speak truth in love. There are two things that can be very dangerous. One is a repressive government. If government is strong-arming society and people, then they can't speak the truth. We see this in countries like where we lived, in Zimbabwe, where if people spoke their mind or spoke the truth or took a stand, they could... They could, their life could be taken or they could be in prison. The other is society itself can sometimes have an opinion. It, society can begin to move in such a direction. In fact, I wrote this down. Society today in America is calling the shots, and yet the vast majority of America's population are spiritually and morally corrupt. It's just a matter of time before the church will find itself being persecuted in a way in this nation we've never known before. So what do you do? How do you, how do you, how do you live? How do you raise a family in this kind of environment? Psalm 11.3 says it all. Listen to it again. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? In other words, what can you and I do? Uh, we live in a world that's very unstable today. We live in a nation today that uh, has a lot of division, a lot of things that are tearing at the fiber of who we are as a, as a people, the United States of America. Yet what are we to do? Number one, let me say this. This is due to spiritual warfare. Understand that. The enemy today, Satan, the one who goes about like a roaring lion, is doing everything that he can to tear apart the fiber of this nation. Because if you destabilize America, you destabilize the entire world. Now let me say that again. If you destabilize this nation... If this nation somehow does not rise up and come together, the entire world and those that are persecuted around the world will have lost the most powerful voice for humanity because it's not in other nations. So this is a spiritual attack. Our enemy would love to divide us. Secondly, 
We're in a nation that's begun to loosen her moorings, her spiritual moorings, and she's drifting. What do you mean by that? When a ship comes into dock, it's, it's not only anchored, but it's tied with these massive ropes. You've probably seen it, where they tie that ship into its moorings, in other, in other words, to keep it from drifting back out. But America's moorings have been spiritual mooring, moorings. Our belief in a sovereign God and our belief as a Christian nation, but we've loosened those moorings. But, but again, what do you do? How do you raise kids in this kind of environment? I want to give you three things real quickly. Number one, I want to remind you that God is sovereign. Now let me say that again. God is sovereign. Now what that means is that God is in control. In fact, if you look at the word sovereign, if you wrote it down, you would find at the end of it, R-E-I-G-N. Sovereign, God reigns. God reigns. God is in control. No matter how desperate it may seem, no matter how bad the news may be, God is still in control. So what do the righteous do when the foundations are being destroyed? Have you ever thought about that? Let me ask you to do this. Take a right from Psalm and go, Psalms and go over to Daniel. Daniel's right past Ezekiel. Let me, let me share something real quickly. In Daniel chapter 1, now, let me give you the background real quickly. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, these were four young men in the time of, of the Babylonian captivity. In other words, what had happened, Jeremiah the prophet had been warning Israel, and more particularly the southern kingdom, Judah, that the enemy, that Babylon, was getting ready to invade Israel, getting ready to invade the southern kingdom of Judah. When Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians came into Israel and they took into exile many uh, tens of thousands of these Jewish people, they took a lot of the young, gifted, talented young men and women like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In Daniel chapter 1, let me read it, and I'm reading out of the King James. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 3, And the king spoke unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princesses, youths in whom there was no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and gifted in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. In other words, what the Babylonians, the Chaldeans were wanting to do under Nebuchadnezzar was they were trying to change the culture of these Jewish kids. They wanted to indoctrinate them and make them Babylonian rather than Jewish. Let's read on. Verse 5, And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's food and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end of the, that they might stand before the king. For three years they were going to be indoctrinated by the Babylonians and by Nebuchadnezzar in every way, in language, in culture, and even in diet. Now to a Jew, you have to understand this, a Jew would never eat bacon. We've got ham for lunch. They'd never eat ham. A Jew was strict in their diet, a kosher diet, and so here Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were about 15, 16 years of age, and the first temptation would come in their diet. Now let's read on. Verse 6, Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now that's one name, but you'll know them. Well, we'll read on verse 7. Unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name Belshazzar, and to Hananiah Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Now look at verse 8. What is that? Young people, look at that, because that's critical. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's food, nor the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Daniel said this, to those that were in charge of him, indoctrinating him. He said, I cannot partake of the diet of the Babylonian. I'm a Jew. 
I can't eat pork. I won't drink your wine. And he was very disciplined in this. And young families, I, I want you to listen. And if you're listening by way of uh, live stream, remember the first thing you and I have to teach our children is that God is sovereign. You know, we forget sometimes that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego no doubt were guided and nurtured and taught by their parents until the time that Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army came in and took their parents were pouring into them. They were saying, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Ahad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. They were teaching their children, investing in them, preparing them because they were listening to the preaching of Jeremiah the prophet. And the prophet was saying to them, you need to get ready. You need to prepare your family. You need to be intentional in your parenting. You need to invest in your children because there is a real threat that is coming. I'm sure Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were like any teenager. Oh, Mom, you don't know what you're talking about. Dad, you don't, you're just not with it. But they were. Many parents today need to spend much more time investing in their children, getting off the phones, getting off Facebook, getting off Instagram, getting off TV, and they need to begin to invest in their children. And do not pass on to your children your ide political ideologies and your thoughts about whatever. Invest the Word of God into the life of your children. Now, what does that mean? Let me give you three things, parents. Number one, first of all, you're going to need to secure salvation in your home. Dad, if you're not saved, Dad, if you're not saved, you better get it right. You better get it right. Mom, if you're not saved, if you're not walking with the Lord right now, you better, you better get it right. And if you're not sure whether you're saved or not, you know, people are asking this question. Are we living in the last days? Are we near the rapture of the church? Hey, listen, yes. Yes, we are. I'd say we're closer to the second coming of Jesus Christ than it's ever been before. In the Bible, Paul said this. He said, and we who are alive and remain shall be called up together. The word called up means to be snatched up. It's the rapture of the church. And everything that we are doing now is right here in the Bible. God does not give you and I prophecy to scare us. He gives us prophecy to prepare us. Salvation needs to be secured. In other words, homes, moms, dads need to sit down with children and say, listen, you've not made a profession of faith. I want you to do that. I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you about what it means to repent, give your life to Christ. I want you and mom and dad and brothers and sisters all to be secure in your salvation. Secondly, you need to strengthen sanctification in your home. What does this mean? Let me, let me give it to you real quickly. This is not the time in this nation to live in sin. This is not the time to live in sin. It's not the time to slip around in another relationship. This is not the time to slip around in pornography. This is not the time to slip around in drugs and alcohol. This is not the time to reject and not give the time and attention to your family. This is not the time for you to be so sold out on, on, on ball and sports and other things. You know, Adrian Rogers said this. He said, Ephraim is joined to his idols. Leave him alone. In other words, there'll come a point that you become so drawn and tied to your idol, whatever it may be, that God can't even get your attention anymore. Nothing more important than sanctification. What is that? It's God conforming you into the image of his son. And he does that in an inside job of putting the Holy Spirit in your life and in my life. He's conforming us into the image of Christ, into the image of his son. And this is not the time for you to quench the Holy Spirit. First Thessalonians 5.19, which means to put out the fire 
of the Holy Spirit, and this is not the time for you to grieve the Holy Spirit. Paul spoke of that in Ephesians chapter 4. And to grieve the Holy Spirit means this, the Holy Spirit in you is weeping. My friend, let me tell you something. As a family, you and your kids and your family right now do not need to be living in sin. That's young people too. Thirdly, the sacred needs to be solidified. What do you mean by that? Well, number one, you need to understand that God, you're sovereign. And because God is sovereign, I want to make sure as a parent, as a grandfather, I want to make sure that my salvation is secure. Hey, I want to say to my children, my grandchildren, my 16 grandchildren, and to you as a congregation, that I know, 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 that if I die or Christ comes, I'm going. I secured my salvation in Meridian. Pastoring my second church, got out on my knees and settled my salvation because for years I doubted. This is no time to doubt. Salvation needs to be secured. Sanctification needs to be strengthened. You need to be about right now. God, I want to be conformed into the image of your Son. I don't want to quench your Holy Spirit. I don't want to grieve your Holy Spirit. I don't want to live in habitual sin. Thirdly, I want the sacred solidified. What do you mean by that? I want the sacred solidified in my home. Let me tell you, you come down our driveway, you'll hear Christian music coming out of a boom box. Some of you don't know what that is. A boom box out of the utility room. If you walk into our house and we're not there, you'll have music, Christian music, filling that home. If somebody ever comes and robs us, they'll be able to get the beat and they'll be able to worship while they're stealing whatever they want to steal. Sacred needs to be solidified in your home. You need to start making it a solid component of your everyday life that you spend time in God's Word and in prayer and you are walking with the Lord like you never have before. Keeping a journal. God, what are you saying to me? You and I need to hear from God right now. We need acts of repentance. What is acts of repentance? Hey, listen, everybody look this way. You know what that is, don't you? Some of us need to go to our TV apps. Some of us need to go to our cable packages. Some of us need to go to the movies that we're watching, the programs that we're watching, the music that we're listening to. And some of us need to clean up our TVs. I told Sheila a while back, how serious am I about it? I said, Sheila, get rid of that app, get rid of that, get rid of that, get that off the TV, that off the TV, that off the TV, get that off the TV. We don't need that. This is not the time in this world and in this nation to walk in sin. Disobedience. It needs to be acts of repentance. I haven't been on Facebook. I, I can't tell you. It's been quite a while. Some of you may have to move your presence from social media and spend more time in God's Word and in prayer. Some of you right now, the church, the fellowship, I don't call it COVID anymore. I call it Lord COVID. Because COVID now calls the shots of the church. That's the truth. Let's just call it what it is, Lord COVID. Isn't it amazing that people can go everywhere? They can go to Walmart, they can go to Lowe's, they can go to Home Depot. Isn't it amazing that we can travel all through the week, but we can't come to church? <laughs> hey, I ain't no fool. I told you I got an enemy, and that enemy is Satan. Let me tell you what Satan wants to do. If... He can keep you out of the fellowship of the body of believers. He has won an enormous battle, spiritual battle in your life. Let me tell you something. We've been married going on 43 years. We've raised four kids. We've been all over the world. Our kids at times have been sick, and she'd bring them and sit over in a corner somewhere with a fevered child laying up on her shoulder. And today all of them are serving the Lord. Oh, some people may not like it. They may say, well, Brother Jeff, I, I think you're being unfair. Look, if God tells you to stay at home, stay at home. But I can tell you this much. The reality is, is that COVID has become the Lord of a lot of people's life. COVID is now calling the shots. God did not give you the spirit of fear, but a power, love, and sound mind. You may
may say, well, you don't know what I'm, you don't know, you don't know how scary this disease is. You don't know what I'm seeing. My friend, you go to countries where there's HIV, cholera, where there's malaria, where there's Belharzia, where there's all these diseases and all this persecution. My grandson, Sam, brought Fox's Book of Martyrs. He's reading through it. He t- he, I read this story in Fox's Book of Martyrs. You know what it was? It was a meeting in the Soviet Union in Russia where Russian soldiers came in and they looked at this little gathering of people that were studying the Bible underground like much of the church in, in, in China. They were, they, were, they were studying the Word of God, gathered in a circle when the Soviet troops came in. Two of them came in, AK-47, machine guns, and leveled on that little small Bible study and said to them, took the Bible asked the pastor of that little group, give me your Bible. They took the, he took the Bible and the soldier threw it down on the ground and he told him to spit on the Bible and leave. And one by one, including even the pastor, said some of them got down and barely spit and were weeping as they were doing it and saying, God, forgive me. When a 17-year-old girl, true story, got up, walked over, reached down, picked that Bible up, and wiped it against her little linen dress. She was down on her knees and wiped that Bible off. True story. When a Soviet soldier put a gun to her head, 17, he shot her dead. The Western materialistic church in America is so sick She doesn't realize that her Lord now has become a tool of the enemy. But what do you do? You may say, well, right now I'm not comfortable coming to church. Then if it's live stream, live stream. According to George Barna, that number's been cut about half. You know what that means is? That means that a lot of Christians today who were once attending church are not doing anything anymore, including live stream. They're doing everything but go to church and everything but live stream. And for all Southside members that uh, are mad right now, you can come and apologize to me at my home this week. Wear a mask. If you're going to live stream with your family, families at home, Your kids need to be in that living room. They need to have their Bibles open and they need to be looking and watching this service as if they're attending church with the same sacredness. But I'm afraid that our enemy is not giving us that. So God's sovereign. Number two, suffering should be expected. And I'm going to close in a moment, but listen to me closely. One of the things that you and I need to understand as parents and as husbands and wives and even among singles, what we need to be understanding of in these times is number one, God, you are sovereign. Number two, as we become more depraved in this society, the American materialistic carnal society that we're living in, the more we can expect to be persecuted. You can expect it. Jesus said in John 16, in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Matthew 5, 7 through 12, I was going to read it, but I won't do that. But Jesus said this. He said, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for so did they the prophets who were before you. In other words, you can expect persecution. You can expect to be alienated, ostracized. Because as our world becomes more depraved, society becomes more depraved, as we move farther away from God and His Word and the principles of Scripture, we can get ready. You and I are living in an alien nation. You can look at this in the area of sex and sexuality. We're sick. We're sick. We're so far out, outside the boundaries of God's word, and we've done this 
in the last 50 years, as if all of a sudden, the last 70 years, it's as if we've kind of woke up and we've thrown off all restraint and we just live and do whatever we want to do. And now we're looking at LGBT, we're looking at transgender, and uh, bestiality is coming. You can ask your parents about that later. Uh, pedophilia is now becoming, could become the norm. We are living in a sexually saturated, sick society. And for you to hold a Christian standard today, you'll be ostracized, alienated. But then last, if you're gonna if you're gonna raise a family in these times, number one, you need to teach them, God, you're sovereign. God is sovereign. Kids, I want you to understand this. No matter what happens to us, I want you to understand that God is always in control. That nothing comes into your life that has not first come through his hand. That he tells you, Jesus said, I hold you in the palm of my hand and no man can take you out. So no matter what happens, son, no matter what happens, daughter, listen, parent, you don't know how long you'll have your children. You may think that, hey, they're academically gifted, they've got this, man, they got the whole world ahead of them. The reality is you don't know for certain what this country may look like even a year from now. If a year ago I had told you what we would be looking at right now, how many of you would have believed me? None. NBA, NFL, corporations struggling. Some have closed. Businesses struggling to make ends meet. Churches not meeting anymore, and if they're meeting, they're a skeletal number of people. If I'd have told you this a year ago, you'd have laughed at me. He said, Brother Jeff, that'll never happen. It'll be a cold day in hell that the NBA's not playing ball. It'll be a cold day in hell when people are not gathered in the NFL practice. Hey, Brother Jeff, that'll never happen. So let me ask you this. If I had told you that a year ago and you wouldn't believe it, what if what I'm telling you now, a year from now, you're going, oh my God, I never knew what he was saying could be real. Parent, you're teaching your children. Mom, dad, you're teaching them, God, you're sovereign. God is sovereign. God, you're in control. God, we can trust you. Secondly, you're teaching your children, get ready, you're going to suffer. It's part of it. You're going to be persecuted. I'm sure Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I'm sure that their parents told them, now, now sons, listen to me. We don't know at any time whether Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army may invade this nation. And according to Jeremiah, they're coming and they're going to invade and you're going to be in captivity for 70 years. Now, I'm sure there's some, I'm sure some Hebrew families, parents, looked at that son or daughter and said when they were real young, said, Abednego, listen to me, son. Listen to me closely. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Ahad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. You worship him and him only. Son, don't you be, don't you be bullied. Son, it doesn't matter what your other Jewish friends are doing. They may compromise. They may give in. They may do whatever. But son, listen to me. Shadrach, come here, son. Abednego, come here, son. Only their names were not. Hananiah. Hananiah, come here. Daniel, come here. Son, you follow Jehovah, God, Yahweh, Elohim, no matter what. And then when they look and say, but what if we die? You know what Esther said? What did she say to Mordecai? She said, if I die, I die. Uh, let's just go ahead and pray because the reality is if COVID has scared us this much, I don't think an invading army from another country, I don't believe we have the ability to stand against what we think. Thirdly and last is salvation. You remember what I said? You want to know that you know that you know that you're saved. This is not the time to be unsure. It's not the time to go back and look at some experience you had when you were 
child and, and, and say, you know, I've, I, I'm just not sure. I've never known for certain. It's not the time to say, you know, when I was a teenager, I, I went down with a group of kids. They went down, so I went down. It's not a time to say, I was at a camp and everybody raised their hand, I raised my hand. It's not a time for mom or dad to sit and say, you know, I don't know if I'm saved or not. How many people do you ask, are you saved? And you know what they'll say? I hope so. Did you get on a plane if the pilot looked at you and you asked, is this plane going to Atlanta? And he said, well, I hope so. I would. Salvation. And let me tell you what I'm about to say, and this will one day possibly get you into trouble. There is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved than at the name of Jesus. And all over the world, all over the world, nearly 50 million are gathered, worshiping together, over nearly 50 million, maybe more, many more, Islamic countries around the world, they worship under great threat of persecution. But they know this, their salvation is in Jesus Christ. Are you saved? Have you repented? Have you given your heart and life to Christ? Are you forgiven? Because there may come a day when that's the most important question that will ever be asked you. Because the Bible says in an hour that you think not, so cometh the Son of Man. Jesus said when you see famines and you see war and you see pestilence, pestilence is disease, when you see all of these things taking place, when you no longer can use cash, uh, the writer of Revelation said, when cash is no longer able to be used, when you're identified by a number and the commerce of the world is controlled by numerical value, and the Bible says when all these things begin to take place, earthquake, earthquakes are at a level they've never been before. Why would God tell us all that? Because he wanted us to be ready. Are you ready? Have you given your life to Christ? Are you saved? Let me pray for you. Our Heavenly Father, we just come to you, and Lord, we love you. Lord, I've done the best I could do. And Lord, you know the battles in the beginning of this message. Your witness, Lord. the sound of that child's voice is a reminder to all of us what lays in the balance. Lord, I pray today that if there's a man or a woman, boy or girl, they've never given their life to you. And right now your Holy Spirit is speaking to them and they need to settle their salvation. They need to know today that they're saved. They need to know that God, no matter what happens, my life is secure in the finished work of Christ on the cross. My sin has been covered by the blood of Jesus. I'm robed in the robes of his righteousness. My sin has been atoned for, paid for. I'm free. I don't have to worry anymore, Lord because I'm yours. And one day you're coming back and you're going to take your bride, the church, you're going to take her home. The Bible says that two will be laying in bed, one will be taken, the other left. The Bible says that two will be working in a field and one will be taken, another will be left. Moms will go to cribs and babies will be gone, they'll be left. Teenagers will call parents and say, where are you? And won't get a call, won't get a return. He'll get an answering machine. One day, dear God, you're going to invade this world and you're going to call us home. We're going to be safe with you. And Lord, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know you, one listening by way of TV, I pray, dear Lord, in the name of Jesus, that right now you move in that home, you move in that heart, and you cause that person to give their life to you right now, wherever they may be. And I pray, dear Lord, that they will sell out to you. Pray for others that are listening. 
I pray for moms and dads, boys and girls, teenagers. I pray for those that are listening right now. Their life is not where it needs to be. They know they're saved, but they're living in sin, private, quiet sin. They don't want anybody to know. But Lord, right now I pray that you would set them free from the bondage of what the enemy has brought into their life to hold them captive. Set them free. I pray, dear Lord, that you would set the church free. But Lord, we've become, we've become frightened, cowering away in corners. I'd rather be sitting in a Sunday school class around this building, listening and overhearing the Word of God, being in the fellowship of the body of believers. Lord, I, like I said, I'm probably more at risk than anybody. He's 65, I take medicine every day. Lord, if I die, I die. You hurt me. I mean, Lord, I pray that, dear Lord, you speak to the hearts of all of us. And I pray, dear Lord, for this nation that you'd wrap your arms around her right now. She's a work in progress. Oh, she's not perfect. Well, Lord, I know this. She's the moral conscience of the rest of the world. And I know, dear Lord, that where we are able to worship, fellowship together, many around the world are not. Pray, dear Lord, that you draw her back close to you and use us to pray for her. God will give you all the glory and honor. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.